Well, thank you so much for being here today. As I mentioned, I'm really humbled that so many people showed up. I didn't expect that, so thank you so much. My name is Lisa Hoving. I have a background in data engineering, but currently I'm the data and AI team lead for a small team. If you want to find me on the socials, you can find me basically anywhere on Lizard08, which is a reference to the pet python that I have. If you want to give some feedback, of course, the QR code is there. Um, at the end, with the feedback or with the questions, you can also fill it in. The QR code will be there again, so no need to just uh, pick out your phone just yet. So what are we going to talk about today? Basically, for myself, to make a really good decision on what data processing tool to use, for me, the best way to learn is to talk about a story. So we're going to talk about Alice, and Alice has gotten a quest from her manager and she needs to do some data aggregation. So first we're going to talk about the quest that Alice has and how she is going to make her journey to the cloud. Of course, some of you might not yet have seen any of these tools, so it would be nice if we kind of already knew what Azure Data Factory, Azure Databricks, and Azure Synapse Analytics was. So we're going to talk about that next. In the end, we want to make a comparison to compare these tools, right? So we're not only going to look at functionality, but we're also going to look at costs, at performance. And lastly, maybe one of the most important things is to make a decision in a subjective way. We're going to talk about that too. In the end, of course, we have to reach our conclusion, right? When to use what? But before we start, I want to make some household announcements. At this moment, we only have like 50 minutes, right? So that's crazy short. It's going to be a simplified view. Just to get to know one of these tools would already be a course that takes multiple days. I don't have multiple days, so sorry. As I already mentioned, in the end, a decision can be subjective. So it's good to know what my bias is. When I started off using the Azure platform, I started off using Azure Databricks. So that's a tool that's always near and dear to my heart. At this moment, I use very often Azure Data Factory, so this is also a tool that I'm a little bit more acquainted with. The point of view that I have is going to be data engineering. So for data science use cases, my knowledge might be a bit limited compared to others that have that specialty. In the end, you're more than welcome to join the conversation. As you might have already noticed, I'm wearing my glasses today. It's because I'm autistic and I have ADHD, so the lights are very bright as an input for me. So if you ever during this talk might feel a bit anxious or you want to stand, I'm not gonna penalize you for it. I already see some people standing in the back that might be due to choice or might not be due to choice. For me, that's totally fine. If you want to interrupt me during my talk to ask a question, you're more than welcome to raise your hand and just ask the question. If we go over time, though, I will let you know to keep it for the end. But if that feels uncomfortable to you, then you're also more than welcome, of course, to ask a question via the app. I think I'll see them coming in here, but if I forget about it, I guess somebody in the back will raise their hand and be like, hey, Lisa, you're forgetting something. In the end, if you wanted to ask a question but didn't feel comfortable to do it today, always feel free to reach out via the socials. I did bring some fidget toys, so if you want to have a fidget toy, just raise your hand and I'll throw it your way, hopefully the right way. Or just come and grab it, that's totally fine. So to start, who has experience using Azure Data Factory? All right, all right. What about Databricks? Quite a technical crew here. Synapse Analytics. Somebody already kept raising their hands like, yeah, I've used all. Pretty cool, right? But Alice has never heard about these tools and she needs to make a journey to the cloud, so how are we going to do that? Who is Alice? Just as a quick story, I usually present this 
in the Netherlands, and I use a guy, and his name is Henk. So Henk is basically the most random, like most often used Dutch name ever. So I went on the internet. I've never been to Wales, just to confess. So I googled like, what is the most common Welsh name? And the first thing that popped up was Alice. So I named her Alice. And Alice is a BI specialist. She's been working for this large insurance company for over 20 years. I mean, wow, she has so much experience. Her skills, she can make all of your graphs look super fancy, like Power BI, totally skillful. Not me though, I, I cannot do Power BI, just as a confession. She can, you know, she has some experience with Azure SQL Server. She can program SQL, of course, has dabbled a little bit in Python. When we think about her as a person, well, she's Welsh and she likes rugby because that's what I saw on the internet that everybody likes here. <laughs> and I think that's true, I hope. But okay, jokes aside, what does she need to do? Her manager came to her and said, well, Alice, we want to aggregate some of our sales data because I want to know what salespeople outperformed from month to month. It's an easy question, right? what salespeople did the best job, who sold the most things. She has quite a lot of sales data. I think this is a very big company, right? About six million records over three years. Well, we're just gonna store that in a parquet format, right? That's quite run of the mill. But what does this data look like? Well, I hope this is visible for everybody, but just to go through it real quick, we have a date on which the sale is made, then we have the salesperson that did it, an ID for the sales and the product, then the product and the sales amount. So it's quite a diverse company, I would say. Some mortgages, health insurance, whatnot. So what do we know? We know that Alice wants to store this data in a parquet format. So what's quite run of the mill on Azure is to just store it, you know, in a data lake, ADLS Gen 2, Azure Data Lake storage. Alice was going to make all of her graphs look super fancy, so in the end we're going to do Power BI. But how are we going to go from that raw data in our data lake to Power BI? How are we going to aggregate that data? So right off the bat, what do you think Alice should choose? Who thinks it should be Azure Data Factory? All right, all right. What about Databricks? Okay, okay, what about Synapse? All right, cool, cool. Some people need to make a decision still, I understand it, it's difficult. So let's start with Data Factory. What is Azure Data Factory? Azure Data Factory is what we call a data integration tool. That means we can do data ingestion, so getting data from point A to point B, and data transformation, like the aggregation use case that Alice has. We do all of this using a graphical user interface, so people that know how to code are like, oh, that's a drag and drop tool. Yes, yes. What options do we have in Azure Data Factory? We have our pipelines in which we can drop activities. We have data flows and Power Query, and Power Query is more a bit if you're used to Power BI, like that graphical user interface. The computational power of Azure Data Factory comes from the integration runtime. But the data flows and Power Query, they use Spark under the hood. So they use the data flow runtime. And as we will see a bit later on, that does come a bit at a premium. I see Microsoft saying for quite some time now that there are over 90 built-in data sources, so to these data sources you can basically connect out of the box. I think it's quite a few more, but I didn't count, so let's say it's 90. So what does this canvas kind of look like if you have it already in Azure? So what we can see on the left is the pipelines, the data sets, the data flows, and the power query that we have. And the data sets are basically the connection to your data, so to speak, so your tables, you could say. Well, you can see that I created a pipeline, it was called aggregate sales, and I created a data flow to implement LSR use case. Well, in the canvas, you can see all of the activities that I dropped there, like uh, sorting and syncing it back to storage and the aggregation and whatnot. So this is what you usually see if you deploy Azure Data Factory. 
But more importantly, besides the question why you should use data factory is why you should not. And it basically comes to the point of these over 90 integrated data sources. Think about it. What happens if your data source is not included? You're going to have a very bad time. So before you deploy Azure Data Factory, make sure to check that, I mean, the chances may be very low, but that your data sources are included. And now take some time to think about that graphical user interface. Given the fact that it's basically a drag and drop tool, the downside to Azure Data Factory is that it offers us with, offers us with little flexibility. We are basically limited to the activities that we have, and if we want to do anything else, well, that's just not possible. What if we wanted to create generic pipelines? If we were coding, we could just, you know, reuse these methods and these, these classes that we might have, our functions. But is it that easy with Azure Data Factory, right? I don't think so, because we have to configure basically everything by hand. What about optimization? If you notice that your process isn't running as efficiently as you would like, you cannot really that easily go under the hood, can you? So think about these things before you decide to deploy Azure Data Factory. All right, but what about Databricks? So what is Databricks? If we think about it from like a very high level perspective, Databricks is what they call a data analytics platform. So we can do data ingestion and data transformation with Databricks, right? We code Spark. But if you want to go a little bit further and want to do analysis and even visualization, I mean, you have some rudimentary like visualization options within your notebooks, but if you want to integrate it with Power BI, that's also totally possible, right? Think about the disciplines that can use Databricks. So data engineers can do their data engineering workloads just fine. Data scientists can do machine learning. There are quite a lot of things in Databricks that you know, are not my specialty, but other people really like using. Then if you think about data analysts, they can query using SQL, for example, but if they can code Spark, then that's totally fine. All of these specialties can do the work on Azure Databricks. It's quite a comprehensive platform. In Databricks, we usually work in notebooks coding Spark, and people that are acquainted with working on premise know that setting up an Apache Spark cluster within minutes, that's like a total pleasure. I remember going to Databricks and before we had something with Cloudera clusters and just maintaining the Cloudera cluster was like a lot of work. We had like an entire team on it basically just to maintain it. So to set up a cluster within minutes, that was crazy at that point. If you want to code the latest version of Apache Spark, then Databricks is the tool for you. They always take care that you know you can have the latest and greatest. So if that's important to you, then go with Databricks. When it comes to languages, we can do Python, Scala, R, Java, and SQL. I put Java here in bold, so pay attention when we come to Synapse Analytics, and then you'll know why. So let's take a look at one of these notebooks. It's quite easy. You can see that I've created a notebook called SQLbits, and then I have a cluster there, and it's running. And then I just implemented the code, implementing the use case of Alice. So I just load in some parquet data, I add a little bit of some columns with it, month and year, then I group it by month, year, and salesperson, I aggregate it, and I order it and write it back. Basically what Alice wanted, right? So that run just fine in the notebooks, and this is something that you would see if you work with Databricks. But again, more importantly, why should we not want to use Databricks? One thing that is really important, and it might be important with all of these tools, but especially Databricks and Synapse Analytics, is that it takes technical knowledge in order to set these tools up right. It's not going to be the focus of today, obviously, because that's a whole other topic by itself. But I will show you a small video later on on what happens if you don't set it up right. Well, going from Azure Data Factory to Azure Databricks, if you want to write good code, that is craftsmanship. If you want to do Azure Data Factory, you can just drag and drop the activities. But good maintainable code that takes some time to learn. 
Azure Databricks, this is a little bit more like subjective, but arguably it's not like other Azure tools. And that makes a lot of sense, right? Because Databricks is not created by Microsoft. But due to that fact, at least in my opinion, connecting data sources to Azure Databricks is a little bit less intuitive than what you're used to if you use Azure Data, Azure data Factory or Synapse, for example. But let me show you that video about what happens if you don't set up your rights correctly. So what you're going to see here is that I'm in the Azure portal and I don't have any resources because I didn't give myself any resources in the Azure portal to the Databricks workspace. But the Databricks workspace very much is there. I just don't have any rights to it. But I remembered that URL from Databricks that I had previously before they provoked my rights. So I'm just going to try and log in to that Databricks using that URL, right? But somebody forgot to revoke my rights in the Databricks workspace. So what do you think would happen? So I'm going through all of the AD things, so I'm getting a call, I'm putting in my code, I'm doing everything right. Do you think they would block me to go to Databricks when I don't have rights in the portal to go there, but I do have rights in Databricks? I'm just there. So if you don't know how access works, it's good to take some special care deploying these tools. Because if you don't do it right, then you run into the chance that this happens. If people still remember the URL, actually, I don't tell anybody, but I did this quite often for my last employer, because we remembered the URL and it just revoked the rights in the portal. It could just go to production. I mean, it makes your life easy, but it's not good. So, okay, Databricks. We need to have some technical knowledge in order to set it up right. But, you know, coding does offer quite a lot of flexibility. What about Synapse Analytics? So, if we look at Synapse Analytics, the same with Databricks, it's a data analytics platform. So we can do data ingestion, data transformation with it, much as what we could with Azure Data Factory. We can also do analysis, data analysis, if we wanted to. Visualization, well, there are so many tools in Synapse. This is, depends from tool to tool, of course, but there's also Power BI integration. I like to think of Synapse a bit like if people have watched Rick and Morty, like the episode with Unity. So Synapse Analytics is a little bit like that, so it just sees a great tool and it's just like, oh, well, I'll take that. You know, you're, you're part of me now. That's basically, uh, I hear some people do watch Rick and Morty, happy to hear. But okay, multiple disciplines, much as with you know, Azure Databricks, can use Synapse Analytics. Data engineers can do their data engineering workloads. Data scientists can create their cool machine learning models. Data analysts can query using SQL in both Spark, but also the, the SQL pools, dedicated or serverless. Well, BI specialists can take care, you know, take account of that nice integration with Power BI. Very cool. And as I mentioned, the platform was quite comprehensive, maybe arguably one of the most comprehensive platforms on Microsoft, on Azure, and it keeps growing and growing. So if we want to create that data lake, we can use the Spark pools. If you want to have more a data warehouse, we can use SQL pools, either dedicated or serverless, of course. Synapse pipelines, that's basically, well, basically a one-on-one -on -one copy of Azure Data Factory. So, I mean, why not take account of the powers of Azure Data Factory, right? We just call it Azure Synapse pipelines. As we already know, these pipelines, the computational power comes from the integration runtime. If you want to query more, let's say, telemetry or log data, then now we have that data explorer in preview for us. It's quite a cool tool and the computational power comes from the Data Explorer pools. So what languages do we have here? And this is more specifically to Spark, because obviously if you do the Data Explorer pools, it's KQL. Um, some people really like that, I, I just can't, but okay. So the languages that we have is Python, Scala, SQL, and .NET. So if your specialty is in Java, 
go with Databricks. If your specialty is in .NET, make sure to go with Synapse Analytics. That's just how it is. All right. But what does this uh, notebook look like? So it's pretty much like a Jupyter Notebooks kind of environment and much the same as what we see with Databricks, right? So I have my notebook here that I created in the left arrow. Then I have a cluster called SQL bits. bits. Okay. Don't tell anybody I said that. It's the ADHD, I swear. Um, so I have some code here. And I just implement the use case of Alice. You know, that's how it goes. I read in the data. I do some aggregations, I add some columns, and then I write it back to storage. Well, on the last arrow below, we can see all of the tasks. And luckily for me, they succeeded, so quite happy with that. All right. But we kind of know the drill already. This is all cool and all, you know, quite a comprehensive platform, but why should we not use Synapse Analytics? As I mentioned with Databricks, it takes technical knowledge to set this up right. With all of these different things, there are all of these different aspects that we need to take care of when it comes to security. And that is super important. If we want to write code, whether it's KQL, Spark, Scala, whatever, it's craftsmanship. We have to learn it in order to do it right. And lastly, here is where it becomes a little bit more subjective, but in my opinion at least, the maturity of Synapse Analytics is not as great compared to Databricks yet. So I will show you why it's yet. But just to give you an exp example, right? So I don't want to leave you here saying, oh yeah, it's not super mature, blah, blah, blah. Let's put it to the test. Let's have an example. So. This is an error that you would get in Databricks if you're using a subscription, because a subscription has like a maximum amount of virtual machines, right? So if you have a subscription that is shared often, then you might run into this error in Databricks when you try to start to deploy that cluster. It might say, okay, well, Lisa, you could try to create this cluster if you wanted to, but if you do, you might not have enough cores to satisfy this request. You can go ahead and start the cluster and notice that indeed, yeah, I didn't have the right amount of cores and then it fails, but it gives me that error when I try to create the cluster. When it comes to Synapse Analytics though, I don't get like any warnings. I just try to create the cluster and then I get this nice error. Available workspace capacity exceeded, session has failed. I requested 38 V cores, which was quite a lot, so you know. But anyways, wanted to get that error out, right? Out of that 50 V cores that I requested, I only had 38. So I took all of the time to try to spin up the cluster, and then I got the error saying, oh, you don't have enough resources as well. At that point, you know, I'm, I'm pretty angry. But what happens with Synapse and also with Databricks, of course, is that these platforms, they improve continuously. So one year ago, I would have argued something else for Synapse Analytics. I would have said, hey, what I'm trying to do here to aggregate, that creates a column, and that column by default has brackets. And I had run this in Databricks before. But when you try to save this in Synapse Analytics, I used to get an error saying, hey, these brackets that you have are invalid characters and hence you cannot save this back to your data lake storage. Pretty strange of an error, right? So I wanted to come here to SQL bits to Wales and tell you all about this nasty little error that I got. But I thought, okay, well, I tried to do it one more time to run it and then it passed. So just to keep in mind that these platforms, they improve continuously time and time again. So every quarter they come out with really, really great improvements. Okay. So let's compare these tools. Let's take a step back. What did Alice learn? So Azure Data Factory, you code using a graphical user interface, drag and drop tool. 
With Databricks and Synapse Analytics, we can write Spark. And Synapse is a little bit more comprehensive. It has that Azure Data Factory in it, right? Synapse pipelines. When it comes to Azure Data Factory, you can do data ingestion and data transformation just fine. But when it comes to data science, data analysis, and data visualization, Azure Data Factory is not the tool for you. It's just not suitable for it. If you want to do Apache Spark, you can using these data flows and that Power Query. We're going to look at the cost a little bit later on. It's one thing good to note, this is a question I often get from people. They're saying, Lisa, I want to store some data in Data Factory. Because it's a, it's a factory, right? We can store stuff in there. Well, no. Sadly, no. And when you take it very strict, then you would also say that with Databricks and Synapse Analytics, in the workspaces, we don't necessarily store data. We store that in our data lake. And that's something different to take into account. So we don't, per se, store data in any of these tools. But anyways, if you want to do data analysis, data science, or even have this Power BI integration, Databricks and Synapse Analytics are perfectly fine tools. So let me ask you again, what do you think Alice should choose? Azure Data Factory? Databricks? I mean, I love Databricks. Synapse Analytics? All right. Interesting. Maybe we compare the tools a little bit more. Because let's face it, we're all cheapskates at some point. We want to have the most cost-effective tool. But is that really so easy? Can we just say, well, Synapse is the most expensive tool, and Data Factory is the la least expensive tool? What about the technology differences, right? So Azure Data Factory has the integration runtime and the activities. And we might have this use case using the SQL pools for Synapse and Spark for Databricks. Can we really easily compare these tools? We would have to try out all of the use cases, right? It's just not that easily feasible. But I want to try. I really want to try. So I thought, you know what? All of these tools, they use Spark, right? with data flows for Data Factory and Spark for Databricks and Synapse. So I tried to make three clusters that are, you know, comparable. So here you can see that Azure Data Factory is, you know, with this, these cluster configurations, a little bit more expensive than Databricks and Synapse Analytics. But in Synapse Analytics' favor, it's good to know that it has a little bit more computational power than Databricks has, if you look at this right. If you think I could do a better job, feel free to uh, give me some feedback on it. I would love to, to discuss this, because I think it's always you know, difficult. But that's exactly the point. Even if we could create three clusters that were 100% equal to one another, which we can't, then we would find that these types of spark that these tools use are optimized differently. So Databricks and Synapse Analytics, they put their own, let's say, sauce over it, and they optimize Spark. So the Spark that you download from the Apache Spark website is not the same as the thing that you run in these tools. It's good to keep that in mind. But if you are so inclined to make a decision based on costs, then it is good to know that data flows in general, at least in my experience, so Azure Data Factory with Spark, is not cheap. So that's basically what we find, is that if we migrate our workflows from Data Factory data flow, so using that Spark to, let's say, programming Spark ourselves, then that usually, you know, we, we gain a little bit of money. Well, one thing on costs, of course, that we always have to mention is the implementation cost is maybe a bit implicit, but if you're used to using Databricks, go with Databricks. Don't, you know, start implementing Data Factory or whatnot. And we actually have quite a lot of customers that do this. You know, you hear like a great talk from somebody and think, oh, Synapse Analytics is the latest and greatest thing. Let's all migrate to, you know, Synapse Analytics. But, you know, that comes at its own cost. OK, Alice starts thinking. If I cannot have the cheapest tool, then 
one just gives me, give me the one that performs best, right? Because I don't like waiting and performance is usually key here. So just give me the tool that performs the best. Fine. So let's think about that. So can we really compare these tools based on performance? At least I want to try. So I implemented Alice's use case for all of these free tools. And just to give you a quick recap on her use case, she wanted to aggregate sales on salesperson per month to see what person outperformed throughout the month. So I ran this in all these free tools three times. I mean, that's fair, right? So the first, if people are colorblind, the first thing is for Data Factory, then the second thing is for Databricks, and then the third one is for Synapse Analytics. Because so I don't know how inclusive these colors are, probably not. So what we basically see here, the first thing that comes to mind is that Azure Data Factory, they don't cache their results. So every run is going to be about equal amount of time. Databricks and Synapse Analytics, however, in Spark, they do cache results. So the second, second and the third run that you get is immediately going to be a lot faster, a lot quicker. So it's good to take that into account. But I want to know the costs. So if you look at these cluster costs that we just looked at, how expensive are these runs going to be? So what we see for Alice's use case is that, as expected, Azure Data Factory is not the cheapest tool. Actually, Databricks is. For all of the three runs, I would say Databricks comes first on performance and costs, then Synapse Analytics, and then Azure Data Factory. But let's take a step back. Is it really so easy to just conclude, well, this use case, you know, Databricks performed best. Just go with Databricks. What about other use cases? What if I had implemented this using SQL versus Databricks SQL, you know, that new shiny photon engine? What if I had stored these results in Delta instead of Parquet? Would these performance differences then still be the same? Probably not, right? Maybe in that case, Synapse Analytics would have performed best and would be the cheapest tool. Do we really want to make a decision on what tool is best based on just one use case? And even if we wanted to do that, and we start implementing, let's say, Databricks today, how is the performance going to be tomorrow? Because as I mentioned, all of these tools, they come out with new functionality every quarter. So maybe next quarter, everything is going to be different. And that's also why these kind of benchmarks that I do, I rerun them every time that I new do a new talk and every time I get different results. That's quite interesting, right? That moving target. So in the end, I would say execution costs and performance, they are rarely a good decision maker, but if you are so inclined to make a decision based on cost or based on performance, then I would say that consensus, at this moment at least, seems to be that Azure Databricks performs best. I also see it in other people's benchmarks. So, all right. What are we left off with? Alice starts thinking. Can we maybe make a decision in more of a subjective manner? So Alice first thought, I want to have a tool that is suitable for my use case, right? And then we found that Alice had a use case for data aggregation, maybe sorting a bit. So she could use Azure Data Factory, Azure Synapse Analytics, and Azure Databricks just fine. So then th she thought, well, if I can do all of these use cases with all of these tools. Just give me the cheapest one, right, to run. But then, well, we could see what was the cheapest tool for Alice or use case, but we didn't really know if that would work for all of the use cases, so that didn't really, you know, work. So she thought, just give me the best performing one. But then we kind of ran into the same issue. So let's make a decision in more of a subjective way. In my opinion, usually it's a maturity versus integration question. 
And that's subjective, right? So in my opinion, as we saw, Daybricks is a little bit more of a mature platform. So people that start using it, they get acquainted with it a little bit easier. And the things that you run into, the nitty gritty details of things, you know, that's just a little bit less with Databricks. It goes a little bit smoother. But, I mean, Azure Synapse Analytics is like Unity. It integrates super well within the Azure platform. It gets all of these new shiny tools. The graphical user interface from the Synapse pipelines, you know, that's integrated with code. So we have Azure Data Factory basically in Synapse Analytics, which is pretty cool. And if you are familiar with the Azure platform, then you will find the Synapse Analytics, a platform that you're pretty much already acquainted with. So that's pretty cool too. So what do you guys think Alice should choose? Who thinks now Azure Data Factory? All right. I mean, there are basically no wrong answers here. Databricks. I love Databricks too. Synapse Analytics. All right. It's not that easy. Yeah. <laughs> so Azure Data Factory, right? That tool comes in handy for people that don't know how to code. If you don't know how to code and you need some data integration, so ingestion or transformation, then use Azure Data Factory. I see a lot of customers implementing this with no experience on how to code and this works perfectly fine for them. However, if you want to do data science or data analysis use cases, if you want to do visualization, and for the love of God, don't store data in Data Factory, it's not possible, but then it's not the tool for you. It does offer us a little bit less flexibility than code. You know, we cannot reuse all of these functions that we have. And if we want to run that cool Apache Spark, you know, in the Power Query or in the data flows, that does come at a premium, usually speaking. When it comes to Databricks, we get quite a mature and user-friendly platform. People that start off with Databricks are usually quite content and happy with it. But do make sure that you know that coding Apache Spark yourself, you know, that's craftsmanship. Setting up Databricks, much as with Synapse Analytics, but arguably also with Data Factory, it takes technical knowledge to set it up right, but especially Databricks and Synapse Analytics, as you saw, if you don't do it right, you're going to have some trouble. Synapse Analytics, however, offers us a well-integrated platform on Azure. We get all of these great, shiny new tools. If you want to code Apache Spark by yourself, that's totally fine. You know, we can do .NET, we can do Scala, we can do, we can do Python, whatever. But if we don't want to code, then of course we still have these Synapse pipelines. So that's pretty cool. As I mentioned, setting it up, I'll just repeat it again. It takes technical knowledge, so please do your research. But if you do your research right, you will find a look and feel that you might be familiar with if you know the Azure platform. And exactly for this reason, I would probably advise Alice to go with Azure Synapse Analytics because she has some coding experience. So if she doesn't want to pay a premium for the data flows, then she can code Apache Spark herself. She can give that a try if she wants to. Well, if you then look at Synapse Analytics or Databricks, given that she's already acquainted with the Azure platform, in that case, I would advise her to go with Synapse Analytics. If that wasn't the case and she was a little bit more new to the Azure platform, I would say go with Azure Databricks because it's a little bit more mature overall. So, okay, I have a little chart to, uh, to make a decision. So if you don't know how to code, and you don't want to learn, boo, then question yourself. Are your data sources natively integrated within Azure Data Factory? If they are not, you are better off coding, trust me. But if they are, think about it. Do you have many activities, many pipelines to create? Do you want them to be made in a generic way? then probably think about coding again. But if this is not the case, then 
you know, feel free to go with Azure Data Factory. It's quite a user-friendly platform. But if you know how to code and you are acquainted with the Azure platform, then you have a decision to make. Do we care more about maturity or do we care more about integration? So a well-integrated platform on Azure. If we care about integration, then go ahead with Azure Synapse Analytics. But if we care more about maturity, then go with Azure Databricks. All right, that was my time. Thank you so much for your time. My name is...